Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar, Top 5 Best Practices for Power Apps and Power Automate. I'd like to introduce my friend Clay Osborne. He is Hello. one of our senior consultants here at Red Level. He will be um, putting on this little webinar for us, but I would also like to thank New Horizons for having us today. So Clay, take it away. All right. Uh, today we're here to discuss Power Apps and Power Automate, um, which are you know part of the whole Power Suite. Uh, kind of introduction first. Um, Clay Osborne with a uh, Red Level and the software development team lead here. Uh, I've been you know a developer professionally for 22 years. Uh, various Microsoft certifications, Nintech certifications. I do a lot of SharePoint development. Uh, .NET development, mobile development, specializing in iOS. And then I get into the, obviously the power, uh, the power suite here as well, doing power apps, power BI, uh, a lot with SQL and um, uh, power automate, writing flows. Uh, so the power platform, this is whole suite that makes up the power platform. Um, and a part of that, you know, is power BI, power apps, power automate, and then the power virtual agents. Uh, there's a lot of AI stuff in there and you know Microsoft's just really building this up to be uh, quite the dynamic suite and it's always growing it's a whole you know part of that whole Office 365 conglomerate of everything. Now Power Apps, um, we do a lot with Power Apps, they, they're typically you know your front end uh, interface that you would use to replace uh, maybe SharePoint lists, standalone apps, mobile apps, there's a lot of power there behind this platform. And the whole point of this is to kind of put it in the hands of just not developers, but also, um, you know, like power users and, you know, uh, pro developers, citizen developers. Uh, it, it doesn't require a lot of, you know, actual back end coding. You can get as complicated as you want in it, but it also empowers you to do a lot with point and click, click and drag and you don't have to have a full on developer to create these. So they're easy to build apps, low code approach to building these apps. You connect to a lot of your existing data sources and uh, different pre-built connectors that Microsoft offers as well as custom connectors, third party ones that can be downloaded and purchased as well as being able to create your own if you do have access to a development team where they can create new connectors that didn't exist before. So you can store your data in common data services, locations, SQL, 365, you know, on-prem or, or in the cloud. And those connectors are, you know, your way of getting at that data. So getting in to the best practices for Power Apps, uh, one of the number one best practices I recommend is planning your app, you know, planning it ahead of time research ahead of time what needs to be done, what your app's gonna look like. Check feature availability. You mean just because you have an idea for a, um, an app doesn't mean that the platform can support it just yet. I mean, it's growing all the time. So there's always new abilities that are coming to the platform, but sometimes, you know, maybe it, the feature's not quite available yet or it's just on the horizon. So make sure you research that before, you know, planning uh, your app. Uh, also look into your licensing, your licensing restrictions. Some uh, plans, you know, some connectors are available um, at a premium. So there's standard connectors and there's premium connectors. Premium ones are going to, you know, actually uh, incur a uh, monthly subscription type cost. Whereas the standard ones that come with Power Apps are free. They just come with the platform. So be sure to research whether uh, what you're planning to do will require a premium connector or not. And of course, you know, there is that ability there to create your own connector. Uh, of course, the time and money it takes to plan that kind of development needs to be considered, uh, taken into consideration and weigh that against the already built connector. You know, will you save time and money by building your own versus just, you know, paying the, the licensing fees for using the premium connector? So it's all you know, give and take, and you just gotta weigh that kind of stuff. Also, is there a similar app already available that does what you wanna do? Microsoft uh, offers a lot of different um, abilities, and they offer a lot of different samples. 
So look at existing apps. Uh, Microsoft has a library that showcases all of these and they'll show you what the platform can do. And you can look at these and get an idea for what you wanna do, how you can do, you'll learn new things too. Like oh, I didn't know the platform could do that. So you can look at it and look through that sample catalog. Uh, design the layout. Now we take a user experience first type approach. It's very important. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of, you know, um, projects will kind of attack something, just kind of jump right in and start developing without really thinking about the interface or how the user is going to flow from page to page. And then they'll have to go back and refactor that to make it a little more user friendly. And then you might be refactoring some of your backend code too, because you didn't design the uh, the business logic to kind of match the flow of what the user is going to be doing. So you, if you plan it out first, kind of get a good outline, a good design of what your application is going to look like first, then that will help you and um, kind of decide the uh, the plan and how you're going to move along. You know, it'll save time in development. You don't have to refactor as much. It's going to look good because you had planned what it's going to look like to the, in the beginning and you've designed everything around that design and consistency. You'll be consistent, uh, like branding and all that kind of stuff. You have a design for your app and maybe a design for your suite of apps throughout time that you're going to be creating all these future apps. You want it to be consistent, consistently branded with your company. So all of these things to take into consideration, very important. And that's why I kind of highlighted the UX that we, you know, that UX, UI UX, we have an actual UX team and it, it, it's very important. It, it kind of leads up the uh, application development process. Design the architecture as well. Again, you know, you're going to save time in development. You're going to spend less time refactoring things because you had a blueprint to work from. You know, it, having a blueprint to work off of is always easier than, you know, kind of just, you know, doing it ad hoc and just coming it up with it off the top of your head, flying by the seat of your pants. You know, you're, you're gonna, you're not gonna have to go back and rework things as much. If you come up with a plan, designing the architecture, is it gonna use SharePoint lists? Um, you know, design what those lists look like ahead of time. Uh, design the fields that are required, any external connections that are gonna be needed, any connectors you plan on using. Design it all, kind of lay it out before you start coding. Uh, and it'll save time. You know, it, it, it sounds like an upfront cost that sometimes uh, seems like a lot, but in the end, you know, that development time is going to be shorter and it, it really, in the end, it all adds up to a smaller uh, percentage. So the next big tip is be mindful of performance. Now, in Power Apps, there are some limitations you have to be aware of. <clears throat> know the limits of the platform. So, of course, SharePoint, if you're using SharePoint as your backend, there is that 5,000 item view threshold that you have to be aware of. You can't query for more than 5,000 items at a time. It'll, it'll error out. You can't return more than 5,000 times in a single query. <clears throat> so you always have to try and utilize filtering to kind of narrow down your results but ahead of time and, and know what you're going to get. Kind of scope small for a Power App. Now, Power Apps themselves also have an item threshold to be aware of. By default, it starts at only 500. And in settings, you can up that to 2,000, but that's still kind of a far cry from SharePoint's 5,000. Uh, and that's kind of where Power Apps delegation comes in. Power Apps has this delegation feature where some features are able to be delegated to the backend data source and some aren't. Some require all of the data to be pulled local to the app before it can do its filtering. And that's where you're going to run into that, that 500, 2,000 limit. Uh, some are smarter and can delegate that to the source and do the filtering on that end and then pull the fewer number of records forward, getting you under the 500. So there's, there's where you have to be real mindful of the limits in Power Apps and architect appropriately for this. Also the connectors, there's you know 600 requests per minute throttle on that. So again, you're not gonna be you know, pounding those connectors. You just have to take that into consideration, you know, what you build into the app. Now there's another function in Power Apps called concurrent. It's an actual function that you use that you can wrap calls in. So when you're loading in data from all of these different uh, sources, different SharePoint lists maybe, um, a 
lot of the times, you know, they're coming in sequentially and that could, you know, lead to extremely long load times. But if you use concurrent, you can say, here's a block of things I want to load and I want to run them all in parallel. Pull all of the data from all these lists all at the same time and uh, don't do them one after the other. We want to get them all at the same time and that'll, you know, slow or that will speed up our load time because in parallel, everything's coming in. But within reason, obviously, if you have 20 different lists and you try to hit them all at the same time and you're pulling thousands of records per list, you're going to chew up your bandwidth and your CPU as you're trying to pull too much in at once. So you would want to kind of be smart about it, maybe concurrently load a number of smaller ones at the same time and have a, you know, kind of stair step on basically uh, get, get them in groups. There is a experimental feature called data. Was it uh, load delay or data delay? Um, it's experimental right now, but that, that gives you the ability to say delay loading this resource until at least the screen has popped, you know, because sometimes, you know, the screen will be rendering and you'll be hitting these APIs at the same time and you want a delayed load where the interface comes up and then it starts loading data. And you can kind of use those in conjunction and try to uh, optimize your performance that way. You know, load these at the same time and then load these, then load these at the same time. Just, you know, a little bit uh, more or a little bit more efficient than loading everything all at once or everything one at a time. You know, just tweaking to get that uh, performance and that load time fast. You can optimize controls as well. So an example would be um, a control that's like a repeating type control. You would want to use a table of such or a container, a, uh, a collection based element and have the multiple, multiple rows of data in this single element versus creating all of those individual fields individually. Uh, <laughs> Um, because, you know, the, the load time and the um, instantiation of controls, you know, of loading many controls all at once is longer than loading one control that maybe has multiple, you know, sub-elements to it. So if you have a single row control versus, uh, or single multi-row control versus an individual collection, you're going to get better performance with that single, um, that single control. Gallery control is a good example of that in Power Apps. Also, and this goes without saying with, with web development even, you always wanna make sure you're using the proper assets for the job. You know, you wanna create your images, your video, your audio, audio, you're gonna optimize them for size because these are all downloading. Just like a website, you don't wanna have a banner at the top that's you know, 200 pixels wide and then you're gonna take some 4,000 by 2,000 you know, um, pixel image and throw that in there. And yeah, it will render in the small space, but it's still a format file downloading just to display. So you got to take these things into consideration. The same thing with power apps. You know, when you're looking at a power app, especially if you're doing it for a mobile device, you've got this little maybe 60 by 60 icon. You don't want to throw some, you know, 1024 image in there and let it squish it in there. Cause you know, you just increase the download times and it just slows everything down. Now user feedback. Now, not feedback is in users giving you feedback, but more or less the uh, ability for the app to give the user information. Uh, it's important to give them that feedback so they know that something's going on, that they don't think the app is frozen or that it's broken or it's not doing anything. One of the important things is having a loading icon. It's you know real simple, it sounds simple, but it makes a huge difference. Let the user know something's happening. Let them know that this is part of your plan, that something is in the background and something is taking place right now. Having that little spinning progress bar, it's, it's important. And that comes back to the user experience. You want to guide your user through the process. Now along these same lines, enabling and disabling fields. You want to block or open fields appropriately as the, inter, uh, the user is interacting with it. So, for example, if the user presses the submit button, disable that submit button as soon as they push it. You know, I've been on a lot of sites where I'll go and I'll push the submit button and it'll just sit there. No progress. You don't know if anything's going on. Did I miss the button? Did I actually hit it? I'll hit it a second time and now I've submitted twice. But, 
you know, give them that feedback. Disable the button so they know that it was pushed. Have a progress meter going so that they know that something's happening. And while a load is taking place, the load is pretty important. Um, you know, if, if you're just staring at a screen and there's no indication of something's going on, it, it may be five seconds before it's gonna come back. It seems like an eternity to the user. If you have a loading meter, let's say it's 10 seconds for it to come back, it's a lot longer, but it just seems faster for some reason, <laughs> you know, because you're not staring at blank, wondering if you clicked it or not. It, you know, these things are important for the user's experience using your app. Make it intuitive, easy to use. Um, and another one is user pop-ups. You know, you, you can take advantage of pop-ups to just give them a quick and efficient way of offering, you know, additional information to the user. Uh, these can be data driven too. Uh, Power Apps gives you the ability to specify variables, you know, functions, that kind of stuff in the user pop-ups, uh, the text that's displayed. So you could have maybe a SharePoint list on the back end that has a collection of the data that you want to show. So you can have this completely data driven where you don't have to compile and redeploy the app, you know, a content managed in that sense. So the next tip for Power Apps is grouping of controls. So when you have different collections in the system, different sets of fields, utilizing those repeating controls, it kind of comes back to the multi versus uh, single fields um, uh, item I talked about before, but you utilizing these repeating controls versus a bunch of individual controls, you can, now you're able to move the group throughout the form. If you need to refactor the form at all, maybe change the layout, it's easy to grab this one group and move everything versus one, one field at a time. And it takes a lot longer. Um, same thing with, you know, use containers. So there's a group control and you can tie, you can tie a whole bunch of fields together. You can group them together so that they act as one. When you drag the one, you're dragging them all. You know, those kinds of things for efficiency you're gonna to wanna to take advantage of. It just helps immensely when it comes to refactoring those layouts. Quick and easy, it also, lends itself well to doing tabbed interfaces. It's, it's kind of a requirement for tabbed interfaces. If you want to click on a tab and have it show that page full of controls, you don't want to have logic there that says, when I click this tab, show this control, show this control, show this control, show this control, hide this control, hide this control. You don't want to have that big mess. You just want to have a panel of controls and hide and show that one panel all at once. And then of course, attacking, you know, the doing grouping controls kind of gives you these bite sized chunks of logic that lets kind of like a wizard that lets the user go through your app. You know, users find it a lot easier to complete a job when it's split up in smaller tasks versus this big monolithic form that you have to fill out and scroll down. It just seems like it's taking forever to get down through this form. Well, when is it going to end? But when you have these little chunks, you know, they're finishing each little chunk, it feels like you've gotten some real progress when you've kicked on to the next page. And you know, oh, it's only five questions, do, 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 done, ah, just five more. You know, and it, it, it is a big difference in user experience and flow. So another big tip is practice, you know, just get out there and create apps. You know, the best way to learn is by doing it, you know, design, refine, and do. Create as many apps as you can, and um, just getting into the ecosystem and knowing the ecosystem and practicing what needs to be done. You know, study the platform, stay informed and explore the new features. You know, Microsoft often sends out, you know, bulletins of all the new features that have come into the platform and you're gonna wanna keep up on those because some of them, when it comes to refactoring, are gonna help out. You know, maybe you did some sort of hack to get this feature to work the way you want it to do, but then Microsoft releases a new feature that kind of replaces the need for that. And you're gonna to wanna to go back and kind of, you know, you know, of course within reason as budgets allow, you know, totally understand in the consulting world, when you've got an app that's built and that's out there, you know, for a client, you know, you can't always go back and just spend time refactoring that. But if you do have that option, you know, it's always a good idea to simplify the app for easier future maintainability. You know, you don't want to have all of these hacks everywhere that, you know, someone comes in and looks at it and they go, well, why didn't he use this? Well, that didn't exist at the time. You know, so that also kind of brings up the important thing of making comments and, you know, knowing if you did some weird hack, <laughs> commenting why you did it that way, just so that future 
developers looking at the same code don't have as many issues supporting it. So I move on to Power Automate. Power Apps and Power Automate go together very well, as well as sitting apart. Uh, Power Automate was previously called Flow, and they've renamed it to Power Automate to fit into that Power Suite, the whole Power keyword there. Uh, of course, what can Power Automate do? It's workflow, essentially. Um, you know, you can automate a lot of mundane uh, tasks and, you know, save a lot of time there, accelerating, you know, you're accelerating your productivity there. Um, they've got a lot of the intelligence built into this, you know, the secure integration with Microsoft systems. It's just a part of the suite versus a third party workflow system, maybe where it's, you know, kind of an add on. This is just, it's just built right into the whole ecosystem. And again, it's got the same kind of idea where you don't need a hardcore developer to do it. You can get real down and dirty. If you have a hardcore developer, it has that power, but it also has that high level overview of easy, you know, the ease of clicking and dragging and creating a workflow using a powerful interface. So again, some of these are going to seem, some of these may seem kind of repetitive from the, uh, top five of power apps, but they, they do, you know, apply here as well. So, you know, planning your app in this case, plan the process. You're going to want to research ahead of time, make sure again, that feature availability uh, and make sure there's licensing uh, uh, around the connectors you want to use, how many users are needed to actually publish and use your flow or your power automate task. Uh, I still kind of call them flows. Uh, and the availability of the connectors, whether you have to use a standard or a premium. Looking at the existing examples again, so here's you know Microsoft's uh, library of templates. So they offer an extensive templates library, flows that you can go out and you can grab and start from, or look at, see how they did things. But there's a lot out there, so chances are whatever you're trying to do, there's a good starting point, a good platform to jump off of without having to do it completely from scratch. Important is to, in planning of your app, is to outline the steps. Plan your workflow, create a document of it, uh, a, a diagram of it, visualize it. You know, it'll save time later by not having to refactor so much. Again, with that user experience type thing, now this is a back-end process, so there's not really user experience, quote unquote, no interface to look at, but actually coming up with a diagram, maybe using Visio and coming up with the steps, kind of plan it out because, you know, if you just kind of do it at the seat of your pants again and go through and start just developing, you're going to find at some point, oh, I need to insert this here. I need to move this around. I didn't think about this when I first started this. You know, if you think ahead, you'll have less time refactoring. So again, with the architecture, you're going to save time in development by planning the back end first. What SharePoint lists are going to be needed? What users is this going to affect? what kind of approval processes, what kind of steps, maybe other systems, maybe I need to think about OneDrive, a Dropbox, you know, any of these different types of systems that we're gonna be interacting with. You need to plan it, make sure there's a connector for it. And again, it's always easier to work from a blueprint, you know, versus just kind of doing it right off the cuff. So another important recommendation, uh, best practice is to involve IT. Um, of course, uh, you know, while the Power Platform does enable and encourage end users to come up with their own solutions, that doesn't mean IP, IT should be left in the dark. Uh, they need to know what's out there, what's interacting with the systems. You know, if there's any issues that come up, you know, come up, somebody you may submit a service ticket for, hey, why is this broken? It'll come to IT and they're not going to know what's going on, where this is, who built this, any of that kind of stuff. And it'll be difficult for them to support or at least pass the ticket on to the correct people who did write the solution. So you don't want to have, uh, you know, yes, you can write your own solutions, but we also don't want to have a bunch of cowboy coders out there just doing their own thing with no visibility to anything. Uh, you know, IT involving them early so they at least know what's going on, what you're doing. And of course, they can offer insight and guidance when needed. Uh, if IT is up on the power platform as well, they can give you suggestions and help you tweak things. Maybe uh, something that's a little more difficult to implement, they will have an idea or may have an idea 
or at least you know be able to point you to a resource uh, or another department that does. You know, they have that line to the de uh, development department, you know, that kind of stuff. And of course, IT can help ensure that the project meets the organization's governance and performance requirements. So, you know, there may be policies in place that you're unaware of and you're connecting to some data sources that, you know, IT needs to know you're connecting to or IT needs to provide you with a service account to get to that, you know, service. So, they're going to know all of that kind of stuff and that the governance and the rules that you're adhere, your solution is adhering to that. And um, it's just good to keep them involved. So again, another best practice, having a self documenting process. So labels, 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 I can't stress that enough. When you're in power automate, when you're creating these flows, each step is just by default, got some generic name, you know, set variable, set variable, you know, it's, you know, you want to rename each set, uh, step, each action with something descriptive that lets the user know or the developer looking at the flow know what is going on there. And this is important too, when you're looking at a running flow, especially one that failed, you get a nice diagram of where, what the flow looks like and the steps that it passed through and where it may be currently sitting if it's running where it failed maybe. And knowing those steps, you know, just seeing set variable one, set variable two, set variable three, what variables, you know, you got to kind of dissect it and figure out what it's doing at that point. You know, the default labels are just too generic to be of use to anyone. You know, you want to be very uh, descriptive, you know, update SharePoint list, update SharePoint list, all the way down. Well, what SharePoint list, <laughs> you know, be descriptive in, you know, updating the customer record, updating the client, you know, timesheet, you know, any of these kinds of things, uh, just to let you know what the step is doing. And, and that comes to containers and that kind of thing as well. You're going to want to list what all the actions inside the container maybe does, you know, as, as a whole, just kind of being descriptive of where the, it's like a programming language, but it's very visible um, with, with kind of a Visio like outline. So you just want to, be as uh, transparent as you can as to what the process is doing. And that goes for variable naming too, because you can create a number of variables that you pass around from action to action. Knowing what the variables do, what they are, is very important. You don't want to create a variable that's just like integer one, integer two. You want it to be like the customer ID, the ticket ID, the display, you know, the, the product display name, you know, these kinds of things so that it's easy to follow and doesn't make troubleshooting what went wrong a nightmare. So debug output. This is a good one for uh, developing a workflow, especially a very complicated one. And unfortunately, there isn't out of the box support for something like this, like with uh, uh, designer workflows or like Mintex workflows, you've got a workflow history. You can click on the workflow and you can see, you know, the log of what transpired if somebody had thought to write to the log. Very important in my, in my mind, uh, knowing where it is at any given time, because yes, you do get a nice graphical layout. You can see where it is and what step, but that doesn't necessarily tell you what the variables contain. And, you know, especially in the beginning when you're developing a new, uh, a new flow, you, maybe you didn't get the variable set right, or maybe you had to parse a variable and you missed by one character and you know, that hyphen's not supposed to be in there. It doesn't work with that, but you don't know that until you look in the variable and you can only look in the variable if you're kind of getting some debug output. <clears throat> so while there's no native support, there are some tricks that can be used with like OneDrive or Dropbox that help troubleshoot these logic, uh, you know, these logical issues. What I typically do is I create a variable that I call my debug output. And as the process is going, I will append to this variable. It's a string and I will append to it whatever I want to say, starting workflow, you know, entering this step, Vari this variable equals this, this variable equals that, you know, in, and be descriptive, you know, kind of a verbose log of what the workflow is doing. And then I will take a OneDrive or a Dropbox uh, connector and I will write that file to a specific folder that I've designated for my debug output. 
So I'll constantly write that variable out. Each time I update the variable, I write it out as well. I write out the file. So then I can go back there and I can look and step right on through and figure out you know, what was going on. Give myself a much greater, uh, larger picture of what's going on in the internals of my workflow and where it failed and why. <clears throat> so again, grouping is a very good practice to follow. Using collapsible collections of actions just to keep those actions together. Unfortunately, of course, this is something that the Power Automate platform doesn't natively support yet. A lot of other workflows, um, the workflow engines will have just, just a group and you can add actions to it. <clears throat> now Power Automate, while it doesn't have it, you can kind of trick it and do it. You can uh, use uh, like a conditional, a conditional step. It's kind of like an if, and that gives you a collapsible group and simply setting the criteria of your conditional step to something like one equals one, so it always gets in, and then you use that as your group, and of course give it a label, give it a, a label that means something to what this collection of actions is doing. So that's kind of the workaround for now until they give us that function, you know, functionality, which you know, obviously the platform is improving all the time, we'll eventually get something like this um, some of these things are in their infancy still, and then, you know, it's very powerful, but there are still some features we're waiting on. So again, along the grouping of actions, nesting, um, nesting as well, just kind of putting groups within groups. And it, again, this is just for simplicity of keeping your workflow readable. Uh, it's easier to figure out where you need to go to continue your work or add a feature if you kind of have a nice basic outline of what the workflow does. So if you have this big monolithic, you know, all of these actions peppered all over with, you know, all their logical breaks and their logical parallel steps. And, you know, it just, it's just a big giant line all the way down that you got to scroll through to figure out where am I? And, and it's also performance, you know, in your browser, it gets pretty choppy if you got, you know, tons of actions in there you break it up basically into groups, then you've got your primary entry point and you've got your primary uh, direction that you can go and then you can expand that. And then again, you've got your kind of logical next steps and you can expand and, and you kind of drill down to where you need to be. It just, it's just more organized, you know, that way. It keeps keeps things easier. Uh, you're not hunting and pecking and looking around and searching for this control that you don't know where it's at. So another best practice is to start small. Um, you know, when you're writing uh, workflows, when you want to create and automate processes, first step is to you know take an inventory of what workflows you want to write. You know, create that list of tasks and processes in your organization that can be you know automated, or you know maybe they already are automated, but they're going to be they're going to benefit from uh, switching them over to the Power Automate platform, maybe. So, you know, take that list and then kind of attack that list in a risk um, or, or uh, return on investment uh, type approach. Start, you know, with the ones that are going to deliver the best bang for your buck first. Uh, the ones that are going to automate and save people a lot of time, but they're, you know, you, but they're, it's not this giant super flow. You know, you're not going to want to start off with some giant flow for your first project especially if it's, you know, it takes a lot of time to implement and it really only saves a small percentage of, um, you know, time uh, as, a, you know, as opposed to, a, a, you know, you can, there's a lot of small approval workflows you can write that just save people a lot of time and a big giant one that, you know, oh, I could have kind of done that in just a little bit more time. Was it really worth the investment creating that? Attack the small ones first. You know, learn to walk before you, you know, before you run, uh, getting a small workflow out there, uh, especially if you're new to the platform, you know, you don't want to be taking on a big giant project and then kind of getting lost. And uh, you, you're going to encounter roadblocks, gotchas, and pitfalls along the way in the platform. You know, you're going to go down and find, oh, you know, I, I did all of this development only to find out this feature doesn't exist. And now I have to do some weird, hack. and you're always researching, you know, different hacks, you know you know, take on the projects that are a little more manageable first when you're getting into the platform. And then of course, test, test, test. 
you know, run your workflow often as you're adding new actions to make sure it's behaving as you expected. You don't want to get down and have, I got a hundred actions now before even knowing if the first five work, you know, you, you need to, and then you have to go and adjust and find out, Oh, you know, I, I have to adjust this and I have to rename this variable. It needs to be a string instead of int, but now I use it all over and that these all expected int. Now I've got to rewrite, you know, 10 of my last actions I just wrote because I, you know, I didn't test the first two that I wrote first, you know, so run the tests and uh, you can run the workflow and you'll get that nice little diagram of where you're at. If it fails, it does give you some kind of error output. Uh, of course, you use the logging uh, too, that helps. And then also, um, you know, you can create templates for reusable sets of functionality. You know, you can take action, you can take a workflow, and you can export it, you can create it into a template. And that gives you a good head start on future workflows too that utilize that same set of uh, actions. You know, you're, if you've got something common, uh, maybe an approval workflow of some kind that, you know, talks to a certain system and it contacts maybe the same people every time, you can, you can copy and use that and use that as your launching pad for the next workflow. So I kind of ripped through that pretty fast, I'm assuming. <laughs> um, this is a QA portion. So um, if anybody's got any questions, you know, shoot yep. away. Feel free to ask your questions through the Q&A panel. Again, I just wanted to thank Clay for his time today and for his presentation and thank New Horizons for the opportunity to present to you guys. Um, for any questions that you might have, feel free to add them into the question and answer tab or into the chat window because we can take them through both avenues. Um, I will give them a quick second to do that. Uh, but Clay, did you want to give any contact information in case anybody wants to reach out to you directly? Uh, yeah, um, I, I, I'm on uh, LinkedIn um, under Clay Osborne, uh, as well as uh, see, uh, we want to do email address. Uh, so I can be reached at C Osborne, so C O S B O R N at redlevelgroup.com. Uh, so, you know, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to reach out. All right. Thanks for that. And it looks like we might have a question coming in. So we'll just give it another moment. Um, in the meantime, Clay, I believe you have done a couple of our five minute Fridays. Uh, is there any specific ones that might be best for people to find on Red Level's YouTube channel? Um, any of the ones on our quick starts, we, you know, we offer quick start engagements for uh, power, the power, you know, suite, basically power BI, power automate, power apps, uh, you know, any of those can give you a leg up into getting into the, uh, the suite, you know, um, all of those are good. Okay, there's, I'll be sure to include those. There. There's a lot of content out there that's that's good, you know. You know, definitely check it out, the YouTube channel, Red Level. Absolutely, and we'll be sure to send that out in our follow-up communications with everybody. Okay, I don't see any additional questions coming in at this time, but again, feel free to reach out to us if you have any additional questions, and we look forward to talking to everybody again soon. Thank you very much. All right. Bye.